Welcome to the E! News Money Radio Show. My name is Jim Robb. I'll be your host today. And you're listening to the KJAZZ Radio Network. Bank of America sold $850 million in toxic waste mortgages. This is according to Forbes. The SEC and Department of Justice civil suit has just arisen. So here's what they're saying. The bank defrauded investors when it sold $855 million in residential mortgages in 2008. And here's the contention. The residential mortgage backed securities said they were backed by high-quality prime mortgage loans. In reality, uh, here we go, they were not high. (laughs) They were low-priority loans. So uh, here's what we're saying. At the end of the day, that um, the lawsuits and civil suits continue. Um, but what a shame to have uh, have this kind of thing to start the news off. But I thought it was extremely important when you're looking at Bank of America uh, getting sued nice for $855 million in, in bad security. So let's move on. Uh, second thing on money news, American Dream slipping away is home ownership at an 18-year low. So uh, home ownership went from 69% in 2004. Seven million Americans lost their homes. So uh, lawmakers, again, here we go again, and let's, let's think about this. So, so far with, uh, with the housing market, we have uh, offered to pay first-time buyers $8,000. We have reduced interest rates, ju- done just about everything. So here, here's my only thing with what Mr. Obama is saying and others, that, that they are reducing the amount of down payment that's needed from 3.5% to 1%. I just want to make sure we aren't going right back into the bubble again, causing the same problems, trying to increase consumer spending, which, uh, you know, that can be a problem. Uh, Last last piece is on Blackstone Group. By the way, you might want to look these guys up. Blackstone Group is the largest owner of real estate assets in the United States, the largest discretionary allocation to hedge funds. So these guys sell their properties and their... their, uh, Assets to hedge funds that then invest in uh, in Blackstone. I think they bought like sixteen thousand homes during the uh, during the uh, the downturn, and um, so it's a, a very very interesting uh, a very interesting piece. The sec- the last one I want to talk about for thirty seconds is Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post uh, for two hundred and fifty million dollars, and it was interesting because the New York Times sold the Boston Globe to the owner of the um, of the Red Sox. So I don't know if this is the end thing, like owning a yacht, you own your own publishing company. Uh, but it'll be interesting to follow and see what Mr. Bezos does with the Washington Post. Um, we're going to take a, uh, we're going to take a short break and we will be back with some new guests talking about a new industry. Saturday, August 17th, the incredible Barnaby Bright come to Prescott Center for the Art, Stage 2, for an intimate and exciting concert. Go to www.folksessions.com for more info. Good afternoon. Let me tell you about my guest today, Lane Daughtry, Mark Jessup. These are co-founders and founders of Tinker House Games. Jim, Tinker House Games, what are you doing to me on Saturday afternoon? People, listen to me. This is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. And let me give you an example. Remember my show last Saturday, what did I say? If you're going to start a business, the two top businesses were one, social and casual games, up 173%. Internet publishing, up 133%. So I wanted to find a couple experts that could talk to us about this industry and give us some insights. So I went right to Seattle. I went right to the guys that understand both the casual games and social. And, boy, these guys know what they're talking about. So without any further ado, Lane Daughtry, Mark Jessup, welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing, Jim? Hey, Jim, how you doing? Doing great. Okay, guys, we're going to jump into this right away. And, hey, folks, no niceties. This is business. So, hey, uh, just just give me the example of, uh, say, since 2003, 
what has gone on in the growth in the gaming industry that probably people would not know about? And, and you know me, you guys. I'm a business guy, man. Throw me some numbers. Okay. Well, uh, hi, Jim. This is Mark. Um, I would say that probably the biggest thing that's happened since 2003 is you've seen the explosion of the social casual market, which is probably something people have heard of. If they haven't heard of that actual term before, they've sure heard of Farmville. And I'm sure they've heard of things like Angry Birds. Those are games that you play not only on your, on your phones, but you play them on your computers as well. And, and one of the things it's done is it's taken the gaming industry from the, the niche market that it was with very dedicated, generally male, younger populations, and pulled that out and made gaming accessible to a broad spectrum of people across America and really across the world, all age groups in, in both genders. And so you see a phenomenal uh, growth in the games industry overall as you've seen this huge influx of new game players come in because these games, they tend to be uh, more approachable, more accessible. I don't want to say easier because that's not actually right but just they, they're uh they're simpler in what they ask of players and they're able to be done in very small bite-sized quantities right hey mark just just um, elaine i'm gonna interject here i read someplace and tell me if i'm wrong that there was like 650 million people playing angry birds uh you know what i can't uh, verify that number i do know that they have an enormous install base i think i heard north of 500 million last time i heard a number about them the company that makes that, Rovio, is obviously one of the giants in the industry because they've attracted that many people. And when you talk about this shift over to social casual games, as Mark brought up just a second ago, that is the big thing that a lot of people find attractive about that is just those type of sheer numbers. I mean, once you get, you know, north of a million people playing your game, regardless, let alone up into, you know, 10 to 100 million people plus playing your game, then you're talking about a massive user base. And when you start monetizing those people, even small bits at a time, you know, making a little bit of money off of them, then you're talking about a real revenue stream, and that's why a lot of people are moving over here. Hey, the other thing is, and I'll, I'll do this fast, but, you know, it's funny because, you know, obviously uh, being with you guys for a little while, and you talk about Zanga, and uh, mm -hmm. it is amazing the amount of people don't even know who they are, and they did an IPO and all this kind of stuff, and you're going, you know, they have millions and millions of people playing these games. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And Zing has made an interesting move, too, because they've started to move into, obviously, there was casino uh, action that they did for a while, because who doesn't love a good slot machine? Uh, but also, they were moving into, this is a term I'll throw out, but I will quickly define it. They call it a mid-core type of game. And what that is, is if you could imagine a game like Farmville, which, like I said, I think that's a game that a lot of people are familiar with. You take a game like Farmville, it's a very social, casual game, but then you add to that a story, and you add characters, and you add a sense of this progression through the game. That's what they consider a mid-core. That's something that Zynga's been doing to actually get a lot of the, to up their revenue, even from what they were a couple of years ago with the social casual. Hey, uh, hey guys, uh, another fast question. How does, um, how does what, what Facebook and Zuckerberg just said, that they are going to be a publisher of social and casual games and, and uh, start to uh, uh, take control of this and take their, their, their cutout. Um, I mean, is this something they're trying to do against, uh, against Apple or iTunes or something like that? Or what, what's that all about? Well, it is, it's, it's similar to what Apple does with iTunes, wherein they take, you know, a cut of the revenue for providing the platform. And to a certain extent, that's what Facebook has done already. If they're moving over to a traditional publisher model, what that really means is that they're going to provide a little bit more guidance and be involved a little bit more hands-on with the production of these games to make sure that it meets their business needs. That's generally what a publisher does is come in and say, all right, well, we have the funding. We're going to talk to some expert developers to be able to make this thing, but we're going to understand what the business side of this is, and we're going to make sure that the game is marshaled in that direction or the production is marshaled in that direction. That, I think, is where they're going because they realize that if they can provide that sort of stewardship toward, to the projects, and they obviously have the money to invest to make sure that the projects get done. Then they can make sure that it meets their business needs at the end of the day. And, that's, you know, you see a lot of people moving that way. And obviously there are big companies that's moving that direction. But there's lots of smaller players that are trying to angle that direction as well. Yeah, I, I think it's less about, I mean, I haven't talked to Mark recently. But, uh, 
But I, I would be willing to bet it's less about them trying to get a piece of the action as it is about quality control yeah. and making sure that the games that are on Facebook meet that quality standard. Because, you know, Jim, back we were collaborating. It was uh, the Wild West on Facebook in a lot of ways. You know, all sorts of games could be on there. And as long as it was doing well, Facebook wasn't one to complain. But they have had to face a serious challenge from the iOS and Android marketplaces. And what I mean by that is the phone marketplace. Um, because a lot of people, they play their Facebook games on their computers at home, um, and now a lot of gaming is moving to these phones. And so you actually, Facebook needs to be aware of that, and I think part of their publishing role, too, is just making sure they have quality games on their platform to keep their audience. And just to piggyback on that real quick, uh, whereas before it was the Wild West a few years ago, it's still a little bit the Wild West, (laughs) people have really refined and focused their offerings, and there's a lot more of them at this point, so to really make a name for yourself and get your project out there, you have to have a way for it to, you know, cut through all this noise and chaff that's in the field and really provide a query and interesting viewpoint or game for people to hook onto, and I think that's part of the quality control. You've got to be able to put something out there that people are going to latch onto in spite of all of the competition that's out there, and that's why uh, Zynga is actually moving in that direction, I think. Hey, you know what we're going to do is, um, I think we're going to take a, a slight break right here, and then I'm going to come back, and what I want to do is just uh, talk to you guys about a little bit about what you're doing, and then uh, the future of, uh, uh, of gaming. We're talking to Lane Daughtry. And Mark Jessup, owners of Tinker House Games. And um, it's been quite an interesting conversation here. So, hey, uh, how do we get a hold of you guys? Uh, well, you can reach us on our website at www.tinkerhousegames.com. And that is spelled just like you'd think, tinkerhousegames.com. I don't suppose anybody out there wants to Twitter, too. You could get us at, at Tinker House if you're a Twitterer kind of a person. <laughs> hey, uh, let's say, uh, you know, we were kind of talking about the size of market, and we we're into Zanga, and we we're into Facebook, and companies like, like Zanga, the company, you know, a lot of the um, uh, audience probably doesn't know about, and, and the size and the multi billion dollar market that's, uh, that's going on here. And hey, I want, you know, before the break or before we came on air, uh, Mark, I just want I want you to go through. You told me that story about 2003 about how the gaming had surpassed Hollywood. Give me the give me that deal again. I think people will be very interested in that. Yeah, well, at the time of 2003, Hollywood, uh, in terms of revenue, was I think valued at about 7.6 billion. And gaming that in, that year, the games industry actually surpassed it and was valued at a 7.7 billion dollars in revenue. It was very interesting because that just went quietly unheralded by a lot of the major news. You know, when you think about Hollywood, you think about big value, you think about lots of revenue and, you know, glamorous stars. And here, uh, the games industry, I think a lot of people up until that point thought about it as just, you know, nerdy guys in their mom's basements playing games, you know, nerdy younger guys playing their games. And it ended up being an industry that that got to $7.7 billion and surpassed Hollywood. And it did it by not just being games for nerdy guys in their mom's basements, but actually games that reached out to a much broader spectrum of the American population. Hey, okay, so real fast, I'm going to put you guys in a spot. Lane and Mark, what's the hottest game out there right now? Oh, geez. Well, if you're talking about social casual, I think one of the ones that you hear a lot about right now is Clash of Clans. And that's actually a pretty good example of when I talk about a mid-core game. Let's get back to that definition for a minute. So in this game, Clash of Clans, you have this little fort, and you build it up, and you have, essentially, it's like a, you know, a Norwegian or Icelandic clan, like Vikings, basically. And you, you, you build properties, and you get things going, but you also, you, you war against other clans. Well, this game is not only popular, it's actually, they're posting, and I don't know the exact number, but they're posting huge profits, quarter over quarter. And this is a game that appeals to men and women and people of all, all ages, and, uh, there you go. It's a mid-core game. It's like a Farmville in that you grow things and, and you uh, do things over time, but then it's got this little bit more complexity to it. It just acts a little more out of the player, and in the process, they've been able to get all kinds of uh, money and, and engagement out of people. Hey, uh, let me ask you a question. What, what do you, you know, so I've known you guys for a while. Um, top secret, you know, this is very proprietary. Just, just between us and your and your viewers. Yeah, it's just between us and the entire <laughs> public radio network. So we're going to keep it quiet. <laughs> right. 
What do you yes. What are you guys working on? Give me something good. Well, we're really excited right now. We're working on a game called Dwarven Delves, which, if we're lucky, it's going to come out just around the time of the next Hobbit movie. But uh, it's basically it is one of these mid core games we talk about. It has uh, an appeal that we think it's a game that will appeal to a broad spectrum of people, uh, and it is definitely uh, there are aspects of it that are social casual, meaning readily accessible to a lot of folks. But then it also has a little bit more complex gameplay so that it, it offers a little bit more engagement for people that want a little bit more out of, out of their gameplay. Uh, we're really excited about it. It's basically it's like a fantasy adventure with some dwarves that are trying to go back in time and learn uh, what happened. Uh, some terrible thing happened to them, and they're trying to figure out what it is. Is, you is, know, that, on, is that on your site? How do, how do, I, how do I get a – do well, I send them to the Tinker House game site or what? If you really want to want to uh, get a, as much as you can about Dwarven Delve, we actually have a Kickstarter campaign going right now. Uh, Kickstarter is this great uh, website. They basically allow entrepreneurs like ourselves to come forward to the uh, American people and say, we have an idea for a game. It's kind of like Shark Tank, I think. <laughs> we have an idea for a game, and we hope you guys like it. And if you do, you can pledge a little bit of money uh, to back the project. And that's on Kickstarter spelled just like it sounds kickstarter.com look for dwarven delve spell it <laughs> spell it quite fast c w a r v e n d e l v e dwarven delve okay and then so what are you looking to get a 500 million yeah we're trying to go to, well we're actually we're going to go for a trillion but we called our numbers down when we consulted our paper ledger no uh actually we're asking for 60,000 and okay. um and it's within reason. We think we can get. That's the ask that we're going yeah. for on Kickstarter. Okay. Um, hey, I I gotta tell. This was uh, this was really fun having you guys on today. And, oh, thank uh, you, Jim. Oh no, no, it was great. And, and, I, and it's such a fascinating industry. And uh, there's so much there to uh, to offer. And so, uh, if I decide to do another one, would you guys be our uh, resident game experts? Oh, absolutely, in a heartbeat. We love talking to you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to we want to do this again. And hey, seriously, so uh, people, go to Tinker House Games, and you can you can look up. You can see Lane and Mark, and see their beautiful shining faces on uh, on uh, on about us. And these are the guys that are just fantastic. And if and uh, I would really take a look at the Kickstarter for these guys. Um, I think they're uh, just very talented young men and have brought a lot to the industry. So, hey, uh, Lane and Mark, uh, thanks for being on the show. We're really glad you're here. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care of yourselves. See you later. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, you take care, too. Hey, let me tell you a little something that's going on here today. Um, you've probably noticed, and I said this in the last show, but let me let me make sure this is clear. The Ministry of Business is now being E News Money, which will be part. And uh, by the way, the website will be coming shortly. So E News Money as part of E News Media US, which is part of E News AZ. And here's the reason I did this. So there's Prescott E! News, Chino Valley E! News, Prescott Valley E! News, and E! News AZ. I think that the radio and how we do with internet publishing, if you remember, that's the second fastest growing business in the United States. I believe that we want to develop a media company that will have everything from video to TV to radio and that we can integrate these different types of, of medium to gr to really help our customers and and our listeners to have something really fantastic. One one example is uh, you know we own a gaming company, so I want to call E News Games as opposed to the crossword puzzle. We replace that with interactive games. Think about E News Real Estate that we want to do. So this is 
E-News Money is a part of all. The E-News Real Estate is not just residential. It's commercial. It's one, what's going on with Freddie May. Or, uh, Fanny, uh, that's good. Freddie, <laughs> Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And I'm going to do that real fast three times. <laughs> so what we're trying to create here is E-News Money will be part of a media conglomerate that owns all these different things to bring quality value to our listeners and to our readers. So I'm really excited about this, and this just happened about two weeks ago. So great things are happening at E-News Money and E-News Media. Commentary and news item, sports news item. I think uh, if you uh, have watched on TV and you have read about... Um, our, our little issue in the baseball industry with A-Rod getting suspended for, um, uh, I think it was 250 games or through 2014. Uh, there were 13 total suspensions, 12 other suspe- suspensions for using um, steroids or enhancing uh, performance enhancing drugs. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this when I was driving over to the studio today and we look at... Um, you know, Mark McGuire and Lance Armstrong and, and uh, the Barry Bonds issues and all this. I, I guess the thing that went through my mind when we, when we look at this, and you got to remember, these guys are just making money. And uh, hand over fist, I think A-Rod's deal was $250 million, $38 million a year. And, and you can really see in their eyes what they're upset about is that they got caught. N- not that they did something wrong. I don't think they really believe that. I don't think Lance Armstrong believes he did something wrong. You look at his eyes. He, he, they're sorry they got caught. And the, my point here is is that the end justifies the means. No matter whether it's in sports, no matter whether it's a CEO in business that does the wrong thing for the company to get the stock price up, and, uh, or whether it's in school. And it's okay to cheat as long as you can get into Harvard or MIT. And I think what this does is forget the sports for a second. It's, it, it, it says that all the records for Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds and all these guys all stay in place. So the fellows that are out there that are honest, playing baseball, doing the best they can with what God gave them, how do they really think about all this crap at the end of the day? They don't say anything. They just sat back and play ball. And let these guys make their two hundred and fifty million, and and have their day in the sun. But isn't it sad that we now have a society that says it's okay to do whatever it takes as long as quote unquote you succeed. And I don't know how you sit down with your kid after this, and have a discussion with them. Uh, especially in an economy like ours, and just after going through, I call it oppression, not necessarily recession, how are you going to do that? So that's the thought for the weekend is to think about that. And uh, I want to thank everybody for listening today. I want to thank them for listening to my friends, uh, good Mark Jessup and Lane Daughtry from Tinker House Games. And as usual, folks, here's what I have to say to you on behalf of E! News Money. I want you to have health happiness and wealth do the right thing folks see you next week e-news money is produced by folk sessions productions for the kjs radio network on saturday august 17th the incredible barnaby bright come to prescott center for the art stage two for an intimate an exciting concert. Go to www.folksessions.com for more info. Relief through its curtains and